Hey there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Experience Maker. This is Dan Gingas, customer experience speaker and coach. And as always, I am thrilled to have you here either live on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook as we are every week, or on the replay on YouTube. Really appreciate you being here. And if you are here live, please share your comments and questions. We'll definitely get to them. It is always a more entertaining show when we get to have engagement from the audience. So as always, I like to bring people to the show who embody the concept of being the experience maker. This is These are people that are doing things in their organization to create experiences for their customers, for their employees, and to teach others to do the same. And so I'm super excited today to introduce you to Christine Reimer. Christine is the Vice President of Customer Experience and Advocacy at a little company called SurveyMonkey, which you may have heard of before, or perhaps taken one of their surveys. So Christine, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be here. Well, I'm so excited to have you here. I've heard a lot about you and uh, I've done some work with one of SurveyMonkey's companies uh, that you guys acquired called Get Feedback. Uh, but really, this is my first time talking to somebody from uh, from the mothership. So excited to uh, to learn from you and, and hear all about you. Um, why don't we start by uh, telling us a little bit about you and your background and what you do at SurveyMonkey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I lead, as you mentioned, uh, customer experience at SurveyMonkey. Um, my journey is is um, to customer experience is it's funny. It's uh, I've heard a lot of other folks that have some IT or business systems background. So I spent almost a decade in business systems and processes. So we're talking like Oracle deployments and CRM deployments and building out data warehouses to really think about how you join and manage data, of which feedback is a critical portion. Um, I then spent about a decade professional services, customer success. How do you really understand um, what your customers' expectations are? How are you meeting or exceeding those? And then I joined SurveyMonkey for, and, and part of a good portion of that journey was into it among the best of the best in being customer centric. So that's really where I feel like the the Brad Smiths, the Scott Cook uh, trained in terms of what it means to be customer centric. I joined SurveyMonkey four years ago. I started their voice of customer team, um, led product marketing for a couple of years. And then uh, late last year, moved back into this role full time of as a practitioner, how are we developing and fostering and nurturing a, a a fantastic experience at SurveyMonkey from our self-service to our sales assisted customers. And then how are we engaging with customer experiences through community thought leadership and best practices of the part that feedback plays? On the personal front, I have to call it out for anyone who thinks I'm not strong in, in applying makeup. It will never be a superpower. But this is not an 80s goth retro, although, you know, there's been lots of jokes. Uh, it is embarrassingly not even, you know, an epic Maverick session. I, I surf um, and I surfed on Sunday and it was a very small day that one would say no one could possibly get hurt on. The good news, I did actually make the wave. I just didn't stick the landing. So, oh. <laughs> yikes. Well, I appreciate you uh, you being brave enough to come on anyway and, and hope that you uh, have a very speedy recovery. And uh, I joked before that I wanted to see what the other guy looked like, but I guess yes. it was just a, a surfboard, huh? It is a surfboard, and, and the surfboard seemed to seem to take uh, take that round. <laughs> I, think, I think that's true. Um, well, uh, thank you again for uh, for being here. And you, you mentioned something uh, that actually was going to be kind of my first question for you, which is I think what's so interesting about what SurveyMonkey is doing is that you are establishing this thought leadership in the customer experience space while you have a product that helps other companies establish their thought leadership in customer experience, or at least become better at customer experience. And so talk to me a little bit about how the, the product itself is involved in how you guys are um, teaching the rest of the world to be good at experience. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So, you know, SurveyMonkey as a company has, it's been around 20, 21 years. We have been helping um, organizations, people in organizations gather feedback from the people that matter most from their business, right? The market, their employees and customers. So we have been and have developed expertise on how to help people gather feedback from their customers. But as you know, our survey platform um, is a multi-use, uh, uh, you know, can you be used for a ton of different use cases? Um, 
what where the game got extra interesting was last year there were two companies we acquired um usabilla which was um expertise was gathering feedback in the digital channels and then get feedback um get feedback superpower was the ability to integrate into salesforce so you could trigger feedback out of your crm which is so critical is one of the big trends we're seeing in customer experience is that integration um trigger out bring that data back in to provide feedback to your frontline employees so they can take action um, and so when it comes to thought leadership, um, you know, it's really, you know this, you, you work with consultants and other consultants and analysts. There's so often these very lofty, you know, this is what great customer experience is. And we all want that vision, right? We all want that perfect journey map. And we all want that perfect team to both collect, analyze, act on, and measure the impact of customer experience. But we know from our peer survey, 50% of CX leaders are teams of one, right? They're hustlers. They have to sell, they have to market, they have to be business systems experts, they have to be world-class program managers, um, and they have to be fantastic analysts. So our angle has been really the importance of agility, measuring feedback in an agile way across the journey and through your cross-functional partners, um, and then being agile and taking action. And that's really been the focus of the Get Feedback platform, um, which is enables you to gather feedback digitally and direct. Um, but it is really the importance of an agile CX program. And let's start today. You know, you want to paint a three-year vision, but it, it starts with a step. You know, I always teach that great customer experience should be simple, practical, and inexpensive. Yeah. Because ultimately, and, and the, the error is that a lot of times uh, other consultants and speakers, you know, not me, of course, uh, will point to amazing companies that create amazing experiences. I'm thinking of like a Four Seasons, right? Oh, Boy, totally. What an awesome company. Except most companies don't have the kind of budget that Four Seasons has to be able to do some of the things that they do. And so I always try to focus on more realistic examples. And it all comes down to understanding your customer. And I, I think what's so interesting is it's not particularly hard, as you sort of noted, to yeah. get customer feedback. I mean, all you have to do is ask and people are more than happy to give it to you. It's what you do with it and whether you can analyze it and then action it. And that's the part where I think everybody seems to to trip up. And it's it's really cool that you're, you guys have built a system that really helps companies do all of that. Because I've been the victim when I was in corporate America of receiving the customer feedback report, which is just pages and pages and pages and pages of, of uh, you know, written feedback or transcribed feedback and the brain can't handle all of that you don't know what to do with it so to help me with the how do we take all of this feedback whether it's from social media or chat sessions or surveys after a call or digital whatever how do we take all of that and turn it into something that we can actually measure and then action yeah it's a great it's a great point well let's let's start it's uh we're filming this it's december you know, the, the beautiful thing about December, the hard thing about December is you're trying to land all the planes for the end of the year. And, and most folks are in planning and thinking about what the what this 2021 is going to look like. So, you know, how do you collect, analyze and take action on feedback to improve the experience? Well, it starts with it starts with what are you trying to achieve? What are you holding yourself as an organization accountable? So for example, most organizations have some type of value on the wall of being customer centric. They um, they have guiding principles. They say it matters. They have a high say ratio. But in terms of doing, the question is, do you have, if you run your organization on OKRs, objective and key results, do you have an objective and a key result around being customer centric? For example, like, we are going to retain our most valuable customers with a plus 50 relational net promoter. Now, of course, relational net promoter score is not the only piece of data, but it starts to anchor and say you are not just listening and not just putting a value on the wall, but doing something about it and saying that you as a leadership team will hold yourself accountable. So I usually start there with what is the mindset? What's your company culture? Um, what are you doing to hold yourself accountable? Um, you mentioned the ease of feedback gathering. Yes, 
but let's be careful there. You know, so often at conferences, remember those, those events you would fly in and then you would go to that like big air room. You, I used to like speaking at those. I, I, hope I, know, I right? <laughs> I, I, I love, I, every once in a while something comes out of my mouth. I was like, oh, Chicago, oh, New York. Um, but at conferences so often I did get asked the question as, as working at a survey company of like, how do I get response rates up? And I can't tell you how many times my, my question was, how long have you been asking for feedback? What have you done to close the loop, either one on one or at scale, to let them know that you're doing something about it? Well, we've been collecting for years. Well, we kind of we haven't really done that whole close the loop thing. And I was like, you are you have lost. Why would someone invest? So that collection part is very precarious. If you are asking and you're not, say, sharing on a thank you page with want to see what we do with our feedback, here's some of the 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 investments we've made given your feedback so that's on on um collect and when i think about analyzing and and i'd be curious on your feedback here um it used to be old school cx is exactly how you describe it or uh, that was my experience which is big massive surveys big massive reports um and then you would try to take action on feedback alone and that's not what i hear at c today you're taking feedback in and triangulating it against who is the customers? So if they're frustrated about this part of the experience, is that all customers? Are they on a certain package? Are they in the first 90 days? Are they in a certain geo? And so taking action in, in, in 2020 and 2021 means you have to actually understand more about your customer in that 360. Um, and then that's where you can get to the action part. You know, it is with and through your cross-functional partners. But I find, again, if you have your goals that include feedback and delivering for your customers you are you are collecting that feedback in a respectful way that is holding yourself accountable to closing the loop um and then you're understanding that joined with other data it doesn't make action easy but it's a very different conversation that i'm having i'll call her out sam bufton is our our um, survey product leader when the two of us are diagnosing what this feedback means and taking action um, in, in conjunction with the other data and how it aligns to our, our roadmap. Well, I love the idea of the OKR and of holding yourself accountable. I think that's so key because often customer experience gets wrongly labeled as kind of a soft skill that totally. doesn't have economic value. And of course it does. If you're improving your retention rate and people aren't walking out the back door, as I like to say, the leaky bucket, uh, if people aren't leaving and if they're staying longer, spending more and referring their friends, there is a ton of value that they can give you. And um, we actually just on my podcast called Experience This, we just had this interesting conversation about playing the long game and wow. how it's so important to understand that you know, every so many companies are so transactional and that trips them up on the experience because they say, well, you know, we're sorry, we, we can't accept that return because our, we have a return policy of 30 days and it's 32 days. Right. And you get into this transactional uh, mindset instead of the long game, which is, wait a second, this person's been a customer for 10 years. They're probably going to be a customer for 10 more or they're going to leave today for our competitor. Absolutely. And so, you know, how do we make that decision? Um I was also thinking your what we were saying made me think about a um, a story that I'll tell briefly when I was at uh, Discover Card that I thought was a really interesting way of of digging through the data to find the gold because mm -hmm. ultimately when I said collecting isn't the hard part what I mean by that is that as long as you're asking you will often get yes. so much feedback you don't even know what to do with it it's like oh. overwhelming um, but that doesn't do anything for you other than you know, now you got a whole bunch of feedback. Uh, and so we were, um, I was managing the website at, uh, at Discover and uh, we had a little, you know, widget on every page where people could leave feedback. And that's where I got this daily report. I got the daily report of feedback. Problem is with 50 million logins a month, that daily report was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of feedback. So unless everybody was complaining about the same thing, it was really hard to go through it and find trends. And I'll be honest, there were many days where I didn't make time to go through it. And, you know, when they stacked up, I sure as heck didn't go back to five or six reports. I just kind of let them pass. 
So what I finally started doing was I added a, um, a quantitative component and I simply asked the question, when people gave us the feedback, I asked the question, this was actually came straight from uh, the Forrester Customer Experience Index, how easy was it to do business with us today? Yeah. Yeah. And after about six weeks of collecting that data, I asked to see the feedback report in a completely different way that no one had asked for before. I said, I want you to sort it by page and I want you to show me the pages that customers are telling us are the most difficult to work with us on. And that's where I want to start. So the number one page that was the most difficult to work on turned out to be a very important page for Discover. It was the refer a friend page, it was ah. the page where we give you 50 bucks for bringing on another customer. And I'm like, well, man, I've never heard a complaint about this. What's going on? Well, that's when I dug in to the comments. Yes. And when I got to see all the comments on that page, it became painfully obvious that for one particular browser, the submit button wasn't showing up. And so people were putting in the emails and names of their friends and then they were stuck. Now, there weren't enough of these complaints on a daily basis for me to see it as a trend, but when I sorted it in a focused way, like you mentioned, it like hit us in the face. Well, that was a simple change. It, the very next day, the uh, ease of use question went back to a normal score because we fixed it. So that got me thinking, why don't we do this for the top 100 pages that are you know, in order of hardest to use? There's, I think Discover had something like 3,000 pages. Uh, so we did that. And we went through the next 99 pages, fixed all of the things that, that popped up because all of a sudden we knew what to do. And it is not coincidental, given that it's 40% of the score, that that's the first year that Discover won the JD Power Award for customer satisfaction. Yay. And so I love telling that story because you know, people are, like I say, very willing to give you feedback, but especially if you're at a big company where you're getting so much, this man, and then I went to McDonald's, it's like, are you kidding? There's no possible way you can sort through all the feedback they get every day, but you have to find the little, you know, the, 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 the hidden treasures of feedback. And then it becomes really obvious what you have to do. And none of the hundred things that we did were difficult, expensive, or time consuming. I, 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 I absolutely adore that story. And, and, you know, what was going through my head is what, you know, this job is so fun because it's a meta job, right? I am both a practitioner, but I get a chance to talk to folks across every industry, across every geo B2B and B2C of, of perspective or current customers, just other CX leaders through the uh, community I run. Um, so, you know, and some of the, my favorite quotes is things like, a relational net promoter program is, is simply a flashlight. It's not the answer. It just shines light in areas, but it's, it's, and sometimes you get those nuggets with that alone. But when you start to triangulate that with what I, what I hear you saying is listening in the moment in that digital experience. And this was the reason the get feedback digital, the, the acquisition of usability was so relevant is because that in the moment feedback is where you can just get this these amazing nuggets, but it still doesn't always highlight exactly what to do about it. The example um, I have from August, September, I work with a, an awesome guy, his name's Chris Seidel, and he was looking at the association of um, folks that stay with our survey self-service business. So he was looking at the top 20 behaviors. What is it that people do that is the best leading indicator that they will renew, right? And it turns out, um, kind of not surprising we've known it, but he had the data that it was deploy, right? If someone, which makes sense, if someone deploys a survey, one, two, if they deploy six, they're renewing it exponentially, and it's 88%, because sure. if they don't deploy any surveys, it's like 38%, right? Okay, great. So then the question was for Chris, well, what do I do to get people to deploy, right? We've been working on this a long time. We have a lot of product, a lot of engineers always thinking. And so he put Get Feedback Digital and he said, "Is it, are people getting stuck when they create? Are they getting stuck when they collect? Are they getting stuck at Analyze? Like what is the reason people aren't deploying more? And what he found once he added these uh, listening posts was <laughs> this like, talk about that nugget. It turns out something like 5% of the feedback in, this, in the week he gathered was people were getting stuck when they created a multi-choice question that included images, they were getting stuck. So now we're not talking about the entire survey creation experience where there's a lot of complexity in there. We were actually talking about when you do multiple choice and you upload an image, it's confusing. 
And so like, that is how, that is like, if we looked at say a relational program alone and it was like, well, you know, is it the creator, the analyzed experience, but suddenly there, you could shine a flashlight in that specific moment, triangulate it with behavior and say, okay, let's fix this. And to your point there, you do need to play the long game. You do need to invest in those long initiatives, but you also, you win by doing what you said. You keep chipping away at it. Yeah, and those are pain points. Absolutely. All so over the place. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I got to create a um, an online course for Get Feedback. And one of the things that I talked about was the difference between what customers say and what customers do. And that when you pair those two things together, you get to see a bigger picture. I love the image of a flashlight. I think that is that's yeah, perfect. Right. Uh, another example that I might give would be, you know, if you have on-site search on your website, pay attention to what people are searching for, because by definition, that means they can't find it. Right? Yes. If it were real clear, they wouldn't have to search for it. So that gives you a clue. Right. And then when you pair that with the feedback that you get from something like a survey monkey or get feedback, now you've really got a richer story. Um, I'm super excited. I have a question from the audience and I'm going to put up. It's a little bit long, so we'll see if it shows up on the screen. It's going to cover us. Um, but Seth uh, would like to know, I'll, I'll cut to the chase, the TLDR version is, have you ever put survey into emails to get a sense for what kind of content customers like, uh, how to reduce unsubscribes, uh, et cetera? Is this a channel that you have uh, worked with in terms of getting feedback? Yeah, it's it's a great it's a great question. So, um, Seth, what I'm taking away from that is um, you are trying to fit. Here's my hypothesis of what's behind that question. You are trying to understand what is the content that you could deliver to your customers that deliver them value, right? Because they're not going to open the darn thing. We all get too much email, and they're sure as heck not going to click through, or they're not going to engage with you, your company, and your product if it's not delivering value. Um, so I, I think, let's see, I'm trying to think specifically. So I think what I, the way I would think about that, Seth, is um, a couple things. So surveys, absolutely. I mean, I, I work at a survey company, I believe wholeheartedly what surveys do is allow you to gather feedback at scale. Um, the other thing surveys do is help you uh, get some like benchmarking data. And so, you know, things to consider on that would be, um, do you have a hypothesis or of what your customers um, would deliver value to them? Not what you as a company want to tell them, because we're all tempted to say, let me tell you, but literally, are you coming from a place of picturing what your customers are like? What are they like on January 10th? Are they burned out? Are they, do they have a, a puppy and kids doing school? What are the things that could help them be successful, help them be confident, help them get their job done? And then by having that hypothesis, by coming from a place of delivering value, when we talk about um, building a relationship, you could survey them and say, we're doing our 2021 planning and we'd love to know what would help you do your job, what would help you be more confident and make it easier. And then you, you deliver that content but it, it, you have to be from a lens we all can see through. I mean, you guys know this. We see through the emails where it's like, I want to help you, but really, I just want to help myself. So please give me five minutes of your time. Instead, like, how can someone when show up to me saying, I imagine, Christine, you're trying to land the planes in 2020 and kick off and you're trying to demonstrate the ROI. Can I help you? Can I get you some content? Can I give you statistics? that will help you do your job better, that'll help you do it more confidently. So that's Seth where I would I would flip the conversation. The survey will give you feedback on that, but I would first start with how are you, how are you delivering value and helping this prospective customer? Yeah, I think that's an awesome answer. It looks like uh, you're hitting on it uh, from Seth's response. I would add to it then, because I think one of the things that he pointed out, which is interesting, is that unsubscribe button, right? The dreaded unsubscribe button. And the problem is once somebody hits unsubscribe, we've lost them. I know. And now it's too late. And so I think I would try if I were going to put in a, a survey. In fact, I think I'm going to try it on my own newsletter is put it right above the up subscribe. And, and the text should say something like not seeing what you want here, question mark. Tell me what you'd like to see. I love and, that. And you have a survey that says, you know, what other kind of content can I give you? Uh, because 
I want to hear that. You know, I when I um, true story, every time I get off the stage from uh, doing a keynote, I always survey the audience on the keynote. And it's not just did he do a good job, but I tell a lot of stories during my keynotes and everyone's different. So I shuffle up the stories. I ask them to tell me which stories resonated and if any of them missed which ones. What that's helped me do over the years is build a keynote where I know pretty much that all the stories are going to resonate because they're the most popular ones over time. And if somebody, if I get enough people that say, eh, you know, that one didn't really resonate, I either kick it out or I rework it. And that's exactly what we need to know in our email newsletters or our promotional emails or what have you is, you know, look, if this wasn't an offer that you wanted to see, Absolutely. okay, thanks for letting us know. Don't unsubscribe because then you'll never hear from us again. But it's helpful for us to know that maybe these types of offers are not what you want to see. I, I, cu I couldn't agree more. I just this morning ran um, two roundtables um, in April, 10 of us, literally my 10 friends that re run CX programs at Salesforce and HP and DocuSign and um, Box got together to say, what in God's name are you doing with your customer experience in COVID? Are you ramping things up? What is changing? How are you dealing? Dealing, And that has grown organically to 100 CX leaders globally, and we meet once a month. And I will tell you, you know, I was working my tail off to make sure I could deliver value to this group every time we met. And the, the game changer was when I flipped it to ask, what? What do you want? What do you want, right? And they're like, I want to understand what people are really doing to integrate their data. I want to know like for real how you run your relational program and what cadence and how many questions. Today's conversation was fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And the topic was we did some research um, on um, CX and COVID and we saw some themes, right? It is risen in importance in the C-level because of retention. Digital transformation is accelerated and um, companies that are agile and gathering feedback and responding to feedback are winning. Okay, great. Those were our three hypotheses. We ran an extensive study. We got some results. Um, one of the pieces of feedback that's related to Seth's question is <laughs> how many people in this call, so 34, 34 attended, and these are directors and above of CX of, of leading companies, repeatedly came up, we used to think as digital, as the way to scale, right? And this isn't always the case. Obviously, there's digital first coming, but digital is often how you how you scale, right? How you show up with your content. Um, but what we heard folks saying is the importance, which we know, is digital is is not just a way to scale, but it's also the <laughs> how you deliver a great experience. Meaning, even the largest customers that in a B two B world might have a dedicated person to help them still wants to self-serve the easiest things. They expect it. And so there was this conversation around, um, and this is where, and, and Seth, what came up a lot is one of the biggest pivots we're seeing in COVID, and I'm playing with an article on how to get benchmark data, is marketing is shifting from all about, I mean, we know it, marketing has not been just about acquisition, it has been about retention, but I heard multiple chief customer officers say today, we are shifting from marketing focusing as much on acquire and really thinking, how do I deliver value to my new customers, to my long-term customers? How do I explain to them what to do and how to do things so they're, they're confidently using the product? And then feedback is how you do that. So I, I, a great question and, and love your story, Dan. Can, can we please get a giant amen to that? Because yeah. we have spent so much time trying to acquire new customers while our existing customers are being ignored and walking out the back door. That's exactly what I call the leaky bucket. Every company has one and very few of them are paying attention to those people that are walking out the door. And to your point, and to close this up because we are running a little bit late, it is the fastest half an hour on the internet as I always promise people, um, is that the, the most dangerous customers are the ones that are walking out the back door and not giving you feedback. Absolutely. Because you don't know what you did wrong. They're yeah. likely going to your competitor. So it's a double loss. Yeah. And, and you're sort of left holding the bag. And so getting that feedback, making sure that they're that they're heard and that they're listened to while they're a customer. Absolutely. And after all, these are the people that are paying our salaries, keeping the lights on and all that. And we're putting all our money and all our best promotions to our new customers and all that. I think that's a very, very smart thing and, and hopefully a rising trend in CX is more focus on existing customers. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Christine, thank you so much. Um, I, cool. I, I got about a thousand more questions I could ask and we could talk for hours and we should we should figure out how to do that because I think we could get a lot of audience questions as well. I, uh, I but, love that. But thank you so much. I hope the eye feels better. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, stay, yeah. stay safe, both uh, both physically and- Apparently, and apparently I have more than a pandemic to worry about. Apparently like my pastime is dangerous. So yeah. Exactly, yeah, be careful out there. Thank you for the Bye. community you've built. And thank you all for tuning in. You got it. Thank you again. And thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, joining us. Next week, we are going to have our final show of 2020. That's right. We're going to take the last two weeks off of the year. And we're going to have PV Conan. He is the founder and CEO of a company called 24-7. It is an artificial intelligence in the contact center a company. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, he just wrote a book called The Age of Intent. And it's all about using artificial intelligence and customer experience, uh, which is certainly a fascinating and large topic. So we'll have PV on next week, then we'll be off for two weeks. And big announcement starting in January, we're going to be moving the show to Thursday mornings instead of Thursday afternoons. It's going to be on at 11 o'clock uh, Central, that's my time zone, so noon on the East Coast, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, for those of you on the West Coast. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Experience Maker. We'll see you next week with PV Conan. Thanks again to Christine Reimer, and thank you for joining us. Have a great uh, Friday and rest of the weekend.